human I can depend on to bring me happy. Welcome to a Captain's Log. We are your only Star Trek TV show on broadcast television. I'm Brian Kreutz, joined by the loveliest host in the Alpha and Delta Quadrants of our galaxy, and that's Lily Fox Loon. Oh, thanks, BK. You always have a way with words, but I know you mean it. <laughs> yes. As we dream it vicariously through our Star Trek guests and super fandom into a looking glass each week vis-a-vis -vis our interviews. Yes, logical, Lily. A Vulcan at heart and sound mind to boot. Somewhere here, there's got to be a pointed ear. Oh, wait. Ew, no, maybe well, not. Well, they're natural. <laughs> natural human ears, just like yours. I had to test, BK. Perhaps. But you do recall on this very show, I visited the Mintakans, who are a proto-Vulcan humanoid species, and altered my ears, among other things, to look like and fit in with the society, avoiding cultural contamination for science observation. <laughs> oh, yes. I definitely <laughs> remember that episode. You were a proto-Vulcan at the observation duck blind post for Starfleet. You mm. certainly had me believing that you were a Vulcan, Lily Spock Slim. <laughs> <laughs> so this week, we have the concept creator for much of the Vulcan technology, including the long-range Vulcan shuttlecraft scene in Star Trek The Motion Picture. Ooh, remember. <laughs> remember. I remember the Vulcans, and now we both do via mind meld. We're foregoing the news next week to get straight to an incredible interview guest, Andrew Probert, as this will be a two-parter. Andrew has been one of the most prolific artists and designers in the science fiction universe for the past 30 years. Remember. For, year <laughs> for years, actually for decades, William Shatner has been asked to return to his iconic Captain Kirk role, and he typically doesn't just flat out say no, but where does that leave us Star Trek fans wondering if he actually will make a return even at the age of 93? Are you okay? <laughs> yes, I think I am. I'm still in the days of yeah, the I see. Vulcan mind melts you put on me. I did it so, I did so good. <laughs> you are a Vulcan at heart. A very poignant idea, though, Lily, I have to admit. Now, mm -hmm. a Shatner-Kirk reprisal for all of us Star Trek fans would be a dream come true to, to see a return of the iconic William Shatner Captain Kirk role just one more time just one more time <laughs> please but Shatner has been working on a documentary titled you can call me Bill so mm -hmm. he constantly is in good shape both mentally and physically, but, right? Why not? It's but Shatner. Okay. Good shape aside, <laughs> there's been talk recently and even a few years ago about a de-aging visual effect oh, uh, technology that has William Shatner intrigued to reprise the Kirk role. Yes. And the proposition of any de-aging news also comes with a condition that must be met. As Shatner states, he would only appear if it wasn't a cameo, mm -hmm. but rather as a genuine reason for the character to reappear. <laughs> only time will tell. Well, there right? really doesn't seem to be much more time. Uh, now is the time. Uh, Shatner as James and a T. Kirk must come back. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> and you Trekkies must come back on the other side of the break as we have a very special interview guest named Andrew Probert. Andrew joins BK and I on the other side of this break. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. The question of the day before we interplay in our open communication channel to Andrew Probert is do Vulcans have a sense of humor? Well, many believe that Vulcans have no emotions and therefore do not understand the concepts of Terran humor. Of course they do. <laughs> and of course, <laughs> and they're very volatile emotions with that. Most Vulcans keep their emotions in check through meditation and control. A select few have successfully purged all emotions and achieved colonar. Though you already knew that, BK. <laughs> Just passing on the Vulcanian cranium constituents of our lovable pointy-eared allies. <laughs> Lily, you are the best! <laughs> <laughs> now let's welcome back Andrew Probert to A Captain's Log. Andrew, welcome to A Captain's Log. We're glad to have you. It is a pleasure having me here, isn't it? Andrew, can you please tell us how you began getting into illustration and art at a young age? You know, when you talk about a young age, uh, we're talking like six years old because oddly enough, I can't remember yesterday, but I can remember when I was six uh, drawing in 
the blank pages in one of my mother's books. And the first thing that I can really remember is a spaceship. We're kind of redoing a Buck Rogers spaceship. And it looked like a it looked like a lightning bolt with windows and wheels for landing. So I guess I've always been into science fiction, spaceships, things of that nature. In fact, it's really funny because uh, my stepdad, later on when I was in high school, I was still drawing spaceships. And he said, he says, you know, you really should kind of expand what you're doing, you know, learn something else because you're never going to make money drawing spaceships. Andrew, your career in Hollywood has had some very successful productions before Star Trek. Now, after your Navy service, talk further about the Art Center College of Design here in Pasadena, California, which coincidentally is where we tape the show and studio in the same city. While I was in high school, I discovered uh, a designer by the name of Sid Mead. And he, his work was visible through different car companies uh, and prevalent in what was called the, the U.S. Steel Books because he would illustrate these books showing how steel would in the future benefit the construction of automobiles and various other kinds of wonderful hardware that he would dream up. And I was just absolutely captivated by his work and eventually discovered that he went to school at Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, California. And that was a goal of mine to find out how I could get into Art Center. So uh, uh, I was uh, working toward that and continued drawing, as it were, got out of the, I went into the Navy, got out of the Navy, still drawing. Um, met my wife, we got married, and um, moved, <laughs> moved in with her parents in a separate area of the house so that I could go to school at Art Center. I started out actually as an automotive design uh, major and uh, quickly changed that just to product design. One of my minors in, at school was illustration. Uh, because I wanted to paint like Sid Mead, and, and which I still can't paint like Sid Mead. Oddly enough, I, one of the paintings I did in class, well, a couple of them actually, one of them was a the submarine Nautilus, which ended up on a Cine Fantastic magazine cover. Um, and I did uh, another one, uh, the spaceship pursuing another spaceship. And that ended up on a Carpenter's uh, record jacket, uh, which Coincidentally enough, I have right here in my little hand. Looks like cool. that. Yeah. Uh, oh, there it is. There you go. See? <laughs> yeah. So, um, those were kind of fun projects. But uh, while I was in school, um, Star Wars was released. And uh, bef before it was released, a bunch of us guys went down to Long Beach State College where some of the artists like uh, Joe Johnson and maybe even John Dykstra went to school down there. But I, we heard that there was an exhibit of Star Wars art down there at Long Beach State. So we went down and I'm, you know, I had to apologize because I've got my nose prints all over the glass of these cases that they had this artwork. You started on Battlestar Galactica in 1978 as a production illustrator, and you then transitioned to the big screen as a major contributor on Star Trek Phase II's successor, Star Trek The Motion Picture, in 1979. Talk about how your designs and the process was perceived from you switching from the Phase II TV series to the eventual motion picture. As I understand, you were recommended for the position on the project by Ralph McCoy. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, a lot of the um, publicity on Star Wars featured the artwork of Ralph McQuarrie. And one of the stories said an LA-based artist, Ralph McQuarrie. Mm -hmm. I wanted to meet this guy because his work was phenomenal. And it's what helps sell Star Wars to the studio. And um, so LA based artist. So I got an LA phone book and looked him up and called him. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, hello, I'm calling for Ralph McCoy. He says, well, this is Ralph. It's like, um, hi, uh, I'm Andrew Probert, and I would like to interview you for my school newspaper. He said, uh, yeah, what school are you going to? I said, Art Center. He says, yeah, I went there for a little bit. Come on over. Nice. So, so I went over to Ralph McQuarrie's house and we talked. And oddly enough, I did interview him and they printed it in the school newspaper. So we kind of got to know each other a little bit. Mm -hmm. Went back to school. My car broke down. Oh, no. And I had to drop out for a semester of school. Mm -hmm. And I went to Ralph and I said, I need to have some kind of work. Can you think of anything that I might be able to do? And he said, well, I'm working on two projects that we might be able to use you. He says, one of them uh, is this new show coming up called Buck Rogers. Nice. And, and the other show is... It's going to be a series called Star World. And, and Star World is being done by uh, John Dykstra in, in the same group that did Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, I got to meet this Joe Johnson guy and find out what that's all about. So I went over there. I showed them my work. They hired me. Nice. And they, they it started out doing helmets and uh, for these aliens. And um, so I was sketching up helmets and, and it turns out that the aliens, these were like robots or something. And then they wanted the entire body done. And so I'm sketching it up and everything like that. And, and in the meantime, they changed the title from Star World to Battlestar Galactica. I ended up designing the Cylons. <laughs> How funny is that? That's fantastic. So, uh, so I did that. I did, uh, I don't know, I built one of the ragtag fleet ships because they, they had everybody says, okay, we need a whole bunch of spaceships. So everybody builds something. So I got model parts and clues together a spaceship. It's, you can actually see in the beginning. Opening titles of Battlestar Galactic is that little flat spaceship that glides out kind of toward the end. Yeah. They're escaping from whatever Caprica or one of the other planets. Mm -hmm. So that was fun. And then they also needed um, a view that the Viper pilots were seeing as they were coming into the landing bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ralph McCory had already done like a little what it would look like back in in the landing bay. And I, so I did a painting of that, but I had to do it full size, which was a half inch high by three inches wide. Oh my God. I painted that and it wasn't quite working because it wasn't giving the depth of the landing bay. You know, the pontoons on both sides of Galactica are, are, have all of those fighters uh, in there. So. Yeah, I wanted to see the length of that. So I did another painting. They used that. I did a bunch of other stuff. You know, when they when they were escaping from the planets, I did flat paintings of planets, mm -hmm. and then I did a half dome of Caprica, and then I had a little dome that I Dremel tooled craters into and made that a moon. So it was like Caprica and its moon, where pe people are escaping from the Cylon invasions. So, so. You know, I was, you know, then it came time for the, uh, uh, the, uh, Cylon base, the star base star or whatever they call it. I don't know. Mm. <laughs> but, um, so I did a lot of concepts for that and, uh, you know, it was, it was great. And I was only on the show for a few months, you know, when they did, um, when they, they were looking for attack scenes from these, uh, these um, raiders, you know, these Cylon mm -hmm. raiders to be attacking the different planets. Uh, I just happened to be going through a magazine, Life magazine or something, and found this picture of Earth. And, and it was a big picture. And I went to uh, to Richard Edlund, you know, the, the 
director of photography and said, um, Richard, take a look at this. I said, what if could he, you use this as a background? He says, yeah, probably. I said, imagine the Raiders going down and doing barrel rolls as they're attacking. So they're like going down and doing these rolls down toward the planet. He says, yeah, in fact, I think they did something like that in Star Wars, if I remember right. But uh, uh, so he ended up doing that. So that's, you know, stupid little things that that I was able to contribute to really made it fun. And, uh, you know, I saw them uh, building my Cylon costume. They did a lot of testing. There were some... Uh, alternate uh, helmet designs, which I did, and they, they built those to consider one way or the other, but it came down that Glenn Larson, the show's producer, wanted the, the, the helmet to have more of a skull-like appearance. So I gave it kind of a snarl, you know, this kind of a snarl, and it, it had to have a built-in scanner. That was one of the requirements. Yeah. And uh, and I so I I just took that 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 grill and I added it to the chest plate so that there was some design continuity going on. And I started to design it more like a Greek warrior with the mm -hmm. helmet because because these things coming down the side reminded me of helmets that I've seen in historical references. Mm -hmm. And I gave them, gave them a little skirt, and I gave them a sword and everything to kind of give them that possible idea that maybe they're ancient astronauts that visited Earth and either influenced the Grecian designs or Greek influenced the Cylon. I don't know. Yeah. That's the whole thing. And uh -huh. Then when it came time for the Colonials, I thought, well, let's just follow that that train and, and maybe make the colonial helmets look like Egyptian helmets. But I was focused on the Cylons and Joe Johnson sort of picked up on that and he, he took that to fruition. So Joe ended up doing the Viper pilot helmets. I ended up doing the Cylon helmets. And it was, a, it was just a great experience. Uh, I think I, because I wasn't a union member, they brought me on because I had these special qualifications. So I think I got my credit as additional art by. I went back to school, my car was fixed. I was able to go back the next semester and jumped into finishing uh, school to get my diploma and I get a phone call. And it's like, uh, hello, and it's just, hi Andy, this is uh, Ralph McQuarrie. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph, what's going on? He says, I've been working on this Star Trek movie. Excuse me, I've been a Trekker since day one. I said, movie? They're making a movie of Star Trek? He said, yeah. He says, I'm doing this design work, but George, George wants me to go up north and work with him on Star Wars 2. So I gave them your name. Is that okay? A captain's log returns in a moment. We're going to show viewers your Andy Probert model of the Vulcan shuttle that you designed for Star Trek The Motion Picture. There were an almost infinitesimal amount of maneuverability angles shown in your design and on screen where the shuttle then latched on to Captain Kirk's USS Enterprise. I went down to uh, Robert Abel and Associates, which was the effects team, actually award-winning effects house in Hollywood. It's got multiple awards for their various TV commercials and other special effects work. Yeah. I was given a Star Trek. I talked to Robert Abel, and he introduced me to their art director, Richard Taylor. And they hired me to work on the effects for Star Trek The Motion Picture. Uh, after, you know, my wife and I talked about it, before I went down, it was like, um, you're studying to get your diploma to do the kind of work that's being offered to you right now. Do I get my diploma or do I go to well, opportunities like this, especially a recommendation from somebody like Ralph? And that's when I decided to go down and they hired me. My art director, Richard Taylor, told me, he says, I want you to design 
right out of school. I want you to design all of the earth hardware, including the enterprise. That way it will have a visual continuity. You know, it'll look like it came from the same design source. Ooh, I love this story. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Um, can you also briefly talk about Gene Roddenberry wanting the Vulcan shuttle to have huge warp engines to indicate how it could reach the Enterprise quickly? Part of the script came up where Spock needed a shuttlecraft to catch up to the Enterprise. The shuttle had taken from Vulcan to find the Enterprise on its way out to go get Beecher. And Gene said, uh, he says, I want this to have really big warp engines because I want this to be able to catch up to this ship that's already in warm. And uh, so I started doing a lot of uh, designs and, and it's, it's like, oh, and by the way, it has to dock, hard dock with the Enterprise. It's like, but it's got these big engines on. So yeah. I do that. <laughs> and so I started playing around with ideas and I thought, well, what if the warp engines were a part of engine part and then the shuttle was attached to the engine part and would detach and that's what would go dark. Yeah. So, so sketches like that and that's, that's the way it turned out was a warp sled and then the shuttlecraft itself. Yes, it is cutting edge technology. These space scenes and your designs at this point in the late 70s, are you kidding me? Now, can you talk about Mike Miner's design for the cargo bay and also talk about Doug Trumbull? I did some ideas for the travel pod based on the script and based on, on his input, he said, well, I want the travel pod to look like one of the office units in the space office complex. Doug Trumbull, to do our effects now. I didn't know any of this was going on. But I heard that Doug Trumbull was in the house and I turn around and here's Doug Trumbull, a close encounters of the third kind and all kinds of other stuff. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you know what's really the coolest thing about Doug Trumbull mm -hmm. hey, was that he was the most important guy that I could work with and look him straight in the eye because he was as short as I was. Okay. <laughs> Richard Taylor was like really tall. Okay. <laughs> Doug Trumbull and I could talk eye to eye. That was very cool. And he looked around, he looked at the studio, he looked at what was being done. He met all of us. And when he started doing the special effects, he collected people from Robert Abel, who had been working on the project, and he wanted to keep them working with him. And I got to be one of those people. So it was really cool. Yeah. Um, so we're working with Doug now, shoulder to shoulder. Mm -hmm. And he's looking at uh, Mike Miner, a kind of a legend with Star Trek, uh, was an artist and designer who sadly passed away, but he was. He had worked on phase two and he had a lot of concepts for Star Trek uh, before the motion picture came to fruition. Yeah. And, and we were looking at Mike Miner's design for the cargo bay. And, um, you know, Doug Trumbull said, uh, how do these pods, these cargo pods get into the bay? And I said, uh, well, I don't know. I says, you know, this is the ship. And we looked at the shape of the ship. The cargo bay would probably be here in engineering. Yeah. I said, the only way to get them in would be through the, um, the I started to say the pod bay doors, how? I started uh, through the um, docking, you know, the landing bay. Yeah. And he said, okay, show me what that looks, what that might look like. So it looked enough. After doing some sketches, I ended up taking uh, photographs of the sets. You know, when special effects are done, especially when matte paintings are involved, there's what's called the plate or the live action plate, which is a scene that's shot without the effects, without the, everything painted in. And then once you have this, then a matte painter will come and paint in what's needed to fill out the whole scene. 
to show the directors what that might look like, the producers and everybody else, they needed what's called a map rendering. So I got photographs of the cargo bay from the floor and from the catwalk going to the turbo lift, which is when Kirk first comes into the engineering section. He's, he's at that level and he looks down and sees the bay and everything. Oh, wow. wow, that is so cool. I remember that scene with Kirk coming into the landing bay. It's a really neat wide angle shot. The, uh, the travel pod was originally like an engineer's inspection car. So, <laughs> so engineers can go out, fly around, look at what's being done on whatever ship is being focused on and talk to their crew. Now, is this the same engineering pod that Scotty escorts Captain Kirk in the first scene tour shown in the film, the motion picture? Yeah, the travel pod. The travel pod was the engineer's inspection car. It had, in order to see everything, again, knowing that the ship was going to be in and out of shadows, I had mm -hmm. a light band going around the whole side and front of this travel pod. Nice. And Trumbull looked at that and he said, I, we're going to break that up. And so he put in a bunch of little lights instead of the one broad light. And because I don't know why, I think he was going back to close encounters where we have a saucer fly by the camera and you have these yeah. lights like stroke, stroke into the lens. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's how that detail came to be. Well, we've run out of time this week, but we welcome you to warp back into orbit for part two of our interview with Andrew Probert next week. <laughs> so Brian and I invite you to pay more attention to your thoughts on Star Trek ship design, both interior and exterior, and consider the legacy Andrew Probert leaves behind for you to ponder until next week. Bye for now. Manifested yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me happy. My old friend, I'm glad you've manifested yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me happy. Thank you, happy.